All we tried to do was log on from our host to their host. You know, this, remember, we're engineers, okay? So I had one of my guys set this up. And we also had a voice line in parallel with the data line. So he had a pair, pair of headphones and a speaker. And so did the other guy at the other end. And so we typed in L. And we said, did you get the L? And he said, I got the L. So you want to type in L-O-G, and then the rest would be L-O-G-I, it would span out the word login. You got the L. Hit the L. Did you get the O? Got the O. Did you get the G? Crash. The <laughs> system failed on the G. And a couple of hours later, we successfully logged in, did some minimal things, and logged off. That was the first message on the internet. Login. Crash. <laughs> Advances in computer networking weren't limited to the mainland. Scientific experiments in Hawaii couldn't be easily connected by phone lines. The solution was to use radio. So was it the engineering challenge that drew Norm Abramson to Hawaii? Actually, it was the surf. I was teaching out here, actually, at Stanford when I first saw Hawaii um, about uh, 30 years ago. And 29 years ago, I decided to move there. Uh, it took me about a year to find a university position there and move to Hawaii to go surfing. I don't know much about the University of Hawaii, but it doesn't just jump to mind as a hotbed of computer research. It isn't, but the surf is a hell of a lot better than it is here. <laughs> we convinced uh, Larry in particular that uh, we could do something that had never been done before technically. And this was what, the Aloha Net? It was the Aloha Net. It was the first network that decided uh, yeah. that it was sensible to transmit data into a computer by means of radio waves rather than uh, telephone lines or, or conventional wires. And we put a, a radio channel together, connected it in a, in a new way to a computer, a, a very primitive computer at that time, and demonstrated uh, wireless data for the first time in and out of a computer. And, and you were doing wireless data in Hawaii because of their islands, is that it? Frankly, I was doing it because of the surf. By 1970, packet switching networks were running on phone lines, radio, and satellite over long distances on land and across the oceans. It was, theoretically, international. By 1972, the ARPANET had grown to include 20 locations, including MIT. The pioneers from BBN settled down to managing and extending the network. TCPIP. These are probably the five most important letters of the information revolution. They stand for Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. What a mouthful. In the glossary of geek, a protocol is the rules that control how different computers talk to each other. The TCPIP protocol was invented by Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn. It determines how computer networks talk to each other. Without TCPIP, there would be no internet. What an achievement, and yet such a name. They could have named it WOW or KISS, but TCPIP? Back to those architects, guys. When I caught up with them again in 1997, what a transformation. They changed the name of the company to Excite, moved to a bigger office, and had even done some cool TV advertising. Most important of all, the company had gone public. After just three years, each of these 20-somethings was worth about $10 million and had money to spend. The web is incredibly exciting because it is the, the fulfillment of a lot of our dreams that the computer would ultimately not be primarily a device for computation, but metamorphosize into a device for communication. And the, with the web, that's finally happening. Um, and secondly, it's exciting because Microsoft doesn't own it, and therefore there's a tremendous amount of innovation happening. <laughs> And the tool for communication is email, baby. That's number one. I must get, you know, I probably get 100 pieces of email a day. But at least 30 of them nowadays come from outside. They come from, hey, but I haven't seen you since you and I were in school together in fifth grade in Belgium. Do you remember me? Every new information technology needs something that makes people just have to buy it. It's called the killer application or killer app. For the IBM PC, it was a spreadsheet.
For the Macintosh, it was desktop publishing. And the internet is no exception. This is a communication network. So guess what? The killer app is a way of communicating. Email. And that's how the lowly at sign jumped from the keyboard into a place of honor in computer history. Electronic mail was also invented at BBN back in 1972. A program for sending files was adapted to carry a mail message between two mini-computers. Ray Tomlinson is modest about his invention. It was just a hack. And um, the, the next step was to get other people to try using it because so far I'd only sent mail to myself first and then to the other people in my group. Ray's hack has driven networking for a generation. One of the first applications we put on the system was from Ray Tomlinson's network email. As soon as email came on, it took over the network. But it was hard to believe that that was going to be a major use of the network. It really was. That was not what had been touted in the first place, that sending messages back and forth from uh, people from person to person was going to be a, a large use of the network. Uh, it was hard to believe for a long time. People to people communications was what excited people. You know, machine to machine or human to machine was not all that exciting. And where did that icon of the internet, the little at sign, come from? Credit Ray for that one, too. I looked at my keyboard on a Model 33 teletype. The one that was most obvious was the at sign because this, this person was at this other computer. In some sense, he was at it. Um, he was in the same room with it anyway. And um, so it seemed fairly obvious, and I just chose it. In the history of PCs, this is the place, the whole enchilada. It's Jerusalem, Rome, and Mecca all rolled into one. Think of anything about PCs. One processor per user, graphical user interfaces, laser printers. It was invented right here at Xerox Park. And that includes a method of linking desktop computers together so that nerds could share work, software, spreadsheets, printers, and my sister's phone number. Push another button, and the information is sent electronically. The folks at Xerox Park in the mid 1970s were living in the future. Long before the IBM PC or the Macintosh, at Xerox they invented a personal computer called the Alto, and there was one on every researcher's desk. We knew, we knew as a fact what the world was going to look like 10 years because we had already. Ready. Using technical ideas from both ARPANET and ALOHANET, Bob Metcalf invented a way of linking Park's Altos together. People don't get how revolutionary that was, but it was our research goal to put a computer on every desk, not let alone every building. So we needed a network that would connect um, hundreds of computers at hundreds of kilobits per second at hundreds of meters of separation. That was our spec. And out popped a network for doing that at 3 megabits per second uh, among up to 256 computers separated by up to a mile along one big piece of coaxial cable which we called the ether. Larry Tesler remembers Bob's breakthrough, a technical triumph of bigger bits and smarter packets. It came up a little bit at a time. First they were able to just send uh, a few signals back and forth and then a few bytes back and forth and entire packets and then they were able to do entire streams of packets and after a while it really worked and they created a lot of Ethernet boards and everybody in Park who had an Alto got a board and we could start using the Ethernet. It was a pretty exciting time. We built computers to sit on everyone's desk and then watched what happened. And so we worked in an economics free zone, which is a way that research is often conducted, and uh, produced this network of PCs, an Internet of PCs. We built our own Internet. Well, the whole vision of why personal computers would be a great thing on every desktop and in every home had to do with using them as a communications tool, had, to, had them connected together. People thought, gee, it wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if we could get these devices to work as a community. And so you suddenly had a device that you really wanted to plug into a network. So they would all work in concert, or at least could exchange messages and share files, and that kind of thing. Uh, so the PC really was gave birth to the networking age. We suddenly had something that we wanted to network. This Xerox sales pitch exaggerated Ethernet's range. It was a thousand feet. But Ethernet still vastly transformed the usefulness of PCs. The challenge now was to design a commercial computer specifically to exploit the advantages of a network. It wasn't long in coming. 